Thank you. It's, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm delighted. Um, I, I know many of you will feel shortchanged because uh, I was really supposed to be Mark Bergman, who's the director of SEBRA. Um, he's much more personable than I am, and he's also quite, uh, quite a bit taller. So I, I did ask if there could be some little box that I could stand on to, to give you the sense that Mark was here, but it was impossible. So I, I apologize for the lack of box. Uh, as, as Rona said, I am uh, an applied statistician, but I want to emphasize that I come here in peace. Um, I, I, I want to, to make peace among our tribes. I'm going to talk about some projects that SEBRA has been working on for the past, for the past well, nearly a year now, and before that, ACIRA, the Australian Center of Excellence for Risk Analysis. And I'm going to point out where these projects have direct uh, ramifications for the activities of the regulator. <clears throat> I promise that I'll keep the formulae and the statistics jargon to an absolute minimum, although I am contractually obliged to include at least one little piece of Greek somewhere in the presentation. You get a prize if you find it. Forwards. So who is SEBRA? SEBRA is a small group, uh, a ragtag group of academics comprising Mark Bergman, myself, Tom Compass, and Susie Hester. But in another sense, SEBRA is everywhere. SEBRA has uh, links with an exceptionally wide range of organizations, uh, both in Australia and outside Australia. As a little side note, we were asked to make our presentations fit these uh, fancy screens, which are 916, and that, that required a rescaling of the images. And I noted with surprise that when the time came to rescale this particular image, CSIRO was already the right size. So they, they seem to have anticipated uh, our needs to, uh, to change the relationship. Uh, among all the images. Anyway, so we have re uh, relationships with ANU, with uh, the University of New South Wales, with the University of New England, and so on. And we draw expertise from all those places because our skills are very limited. The kinds of things that ACIRA has been working on for the past six years, we have a, a smorgasbord of activity and contribution in the broad area of biosecurity and the broad area of the regulation of biosecurity. There's a, there's a shopping list on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the slide that I, I won't read out, but we have uh, co collaboration from West Australia with the Bayes Nets. We have co uh, cooperation with Tom Compass and the value of biosecurity. We look at the the, the prediction of likely places and impacts of invasion using tools such as Maxent, and we think about the value of surveillance and the value of, uh, um, of activity to try to wipe out a pest, and we've been doing the sort of cost-effectiveness analyses with teams at the School of Botany at the University of Melbourne. So we have a, a wide palette of activities uh, that covers uh, analysis and um, model fitting and statistics and, and, and even doing things. As we move forward, SEBRA will encompass five overarching themes of activities that will contribute towards biosecurity regulation. In, uh, the, the, the five themes are data mining, which uh, is in, in my purview. We'll be looking at spatial analysis, the analysis of spatial data sets. We'll have uh, biosecurity intelligence, which is a topic that I'll touch on briefly in a little while, and benefit cost analysis, and finally, pathway analysis and risk-based management. So I want to take a moment to pause uh, to think about the, the regulator. The regulator in this case is the Department of Agriculture, and I want to talk about the regulator's conundrum. The regulator's conundrum is that the regulator is tasked to protect us to protect our economy, to protect our ecosystems, to protect our ag agriculture, broadly to protect our industry from all kinds of pests. Um, so the regulator is intended to be a vast umbrella that protects us from the rain of pests to which we are con continually subject. <clears throat> However, the regulator operates under constraints. The regulator should not cost too much, the regulator should not take too long, and the regulator should not impede trade. And we have the regulator being, we can see the regulator almost as being a rope in a tug of war with all kinds of different interests pulling that rope in different directions. We have the World Trade Organization, we have our trading partners, we have our agricultural industry, we have our populations. Everyone wants the regulator to do something. Everyone wants the regulator to do something slightly different. And this creates a conundrum for the regulator. How do you be the very best regulator you can be? when everybody wants you to be different? Well, 
I, I, the simple answer is, is just do what Sebra tells you. Sadly, this is not an answer that has resonated with our colleagues to date. So we have to have a conversation. So the regulator has to protect us from pests, but, but not too much. It, it leads the, leaves the regulator in a place of needing to let the right one in. And I, I confess to a shameless attempt to hook into the zeitgeist, because that's also the title of a rather popular vampire movie. But I want to emphasize that there's no necessary connection between vampirism and biosecurity regulation, just in case I need to make that perfectly clear. So what does value mean in this context? And I think value, we would agree, means value for effort. Value means that when the, when the regulator steps in and does something, when the regulator acts, we want the regulator, the actions of the regulator to have value to us. Really, we're asking the regulator to be an oracle. We're saying to the regulator, you should get in there and look where you should look. And don't waste time looking where you shouldn't look, because that's not profitable. But do make sure that you catch everything. Well, it's impossible. There's 20 million cargo items every year, for example. That's an absurd requirement that we say to the regulator, only look where you should look. And to double down on this, we really look at the regulator retrospectively. We don't say, look where you should look. We really want to say, you should have looked where you should have looked. When we're thinking about the regulator's impact, we're looking back and saying, did you look where you should have looked? Because if you didn't, then there's a significant problem. But of course, they didn't know where they had to look until they looked. This, also, this, this, this doubles down on the conundrum. So one of the innovations that, the, that we've impressed upon the regulator in SEBRA is to try to vastly simplify the way the regulator thinks about its environment. We've encouraged the regulator to think not about the degree of risk. I mean, of course, in, in terms of broad management, you want to think about how much risk you're absorbing. But in terms of planning, in terms of action, we've encouraged the regulator to think about whether or not they should have been there. That's, that actually turns out to be a very profitable way to think about the problem of regulation. Should we have been there? Should we have opened that package? And even though it, it leads into an impossible question, that is, you know, predict where you should have been before you were there, it still turns out to be a neat way to think about how well you did as a job as a regulator. And so, that's what this string of zeros and ones is, in, is intended to imply. That's an inspection history of when the regulator should and should not have been there. Of course, things aren't always that simple. Uh, often the regulator is cursed with an inactive device that doesn't change slides when it should. Often the regulator is cursed with a plethora of pathways to think about managing them. Not often, all the time, all the time. The regulator has to think about a plethora of pathways, a plethora of potential interventions. How do you find where you should be? So Zebra has been working for the past couple of years on developing tools to help the regulator formalize and construct solutions for this problem of how do you go where you ought to be before you know you really ought to be there. So letting the right one in splits at this point. It, it, it trifurcates into three different approaches that I want to talk about that Sebra has had some involvement in. The first one is when you have history, when you know what you think the environment looks like, because you've been in the environment for long enough, you've been measuring it, you've been capturing things, and you've been taking notes, then you should do data mining. And that, that's one of the, the activities that we've undertaken. When you don't have a history of this kind, when you're not sure about the environment, you need to learn about it. I'm going to talk about a project that has helped us develop tools to gather data in a responsive, flexible way, allowing for regulation where it is best placed and trying as flexibly as possible to reduce interventions on pathways that show, in the shorter term, clean product. And finally, building a an international community of practice to help us impede the activities of pests offshore as well as onshore. These are the three projects I'm going to touch on briefly in, the, my, in my remaining few moments. So there's a picture of, uh, of uh, a Russian oil tanker there to remind me to tell you about Russian oil tankers. They're long, they're large, and sometimes they carry Asian gypsy moths. And you need to get every 
square centimeter of the outside of those vessels inspected by a human being to make sure that they don't have Asian gypsy moths egg sacs on them. These things can be no larger than a 50 cent coin. And happily, we know they cluster under lights. But still, these little things on that big boat, it's a very difficult problem. The lessons we've learned in helping the regulator develop a data mining project are, are simply encapsulated as follows. You can't find things when you don't look for them. So a data mining exercise has value in as much as it provides you with a framework for defining what you're looking for and including the probability, in, increasing the probability that you'll actually find it. Secondly, and this is a really important one, you have to start with the data you have. It's very tempting. It's very tempting as a regulator to look back at the history of data collection and say, you know what, these are not the perfect data. These data are, are flawed because they, they don't record every possible interception or every possible effort that was undertaken. Of course, the data are flawed. This is the real world we're, we're in. You must start with the data you have. By all means, take steps to improve the quality of your data. But don't impede your analytical efforts. Instead, condition your outcomes on the known qualities of the data. You can say, well, here is what the data recommend that I do, but I know they're flawed in the following way. I'm going to tweak this outcome a little bit based on my understanding and knowledge of the pathway. You can do that. But don't forget to analyze along that pathway. The reason is that when people see the data being used, suddenly their interest in collecting quality data heightens. You'll get better data when you use the data you have well. Thirdly, we have to start small. Don't try to come in. This is a classic academic sin. You want to walk in with the, the magic sword of understanding and, and the shield of um, regulation, and you want to protect everybody with this, these, these shining weapons, and, and, and it just doesn't work. We have to start with the smallest possible problems and let those be solved unequivocally, and then grow them. We had to keep our eye on operations. Thank you meaning that we had to make sure that we went forward with, an, with a view to actually uh, operationalizing the solutions. And finally, we need to build bridges within, within the organization. It's all very well to bring innovation, but we have to be sure that the innovation can be implemented and sustained. And this is where the relationship between SEBRA and ABES has become so profitable and so important. If you don't have history, you have to make history. The strategy for making history that we, we introduced to the biosecurity regulator was a tool that came from the 1940s called con the Continuous Sampling Protocol. I'll describe it very briefly. Every pathway starts off in an inspect all regime. That is, inspect every consignment as it comes across the border. After a certain number of inspected consignments, if they're all clean, then shift that pathway to a new mode in which you only inspect every one in 10, for example, because you, you conclude the pathway has demonstrated a, a level of compliance. So you reduce the intervention on the pathway. You maintain some intervention. You maintain a sample, but you reduce it so that you're just monitoring the pathway. And of course, if you find something in that monitoring process, you return the pathway to the full inspection regime. This approach allows you to flexibly and interactively allocate inspection resources to where the immediate history suggests they will do the most good, whilst maintaining information collection on the pathways where you don't think there's a problem. Finally, I want to touch on building bridges. We have a we have developed a community of practice, an international community of practice, using the International Biosecurity Intelligence System, which we use to connect experts on all different kinds of biota across the world. And I mentioned briefly a, a, a case study as a success where uh, a, um, a, 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 a breeder of oysters in France closed down because of uh, infestation of uh, oyster herpes virus. And they sold their equipment on the open market. People bought and imported the equipment to other countries and started noticing oyster herpes virus springing up in these other locations. We were able to detect it using this tool and change regulations so that when used aquaculture equipment was brought into the country, it had to be disinfected. Previously, that had not been mandatory. So by, by means of this tool, we were able to avoid an invasion that was observed in other locations. 
So as an overview, I want to reflect upon the fact that the regulator is caught in an uncomfortable place. The regulator's life is not a happy one. Sebra and through its relationship with ABEARS, ABEARS also provide innovation and support to make the regulator's life easier by making it more measurable and more pleasant. All of our information is available freely on our website. That's, you can see that on the presentation. And there's many, many earlier reports uh, by ASERA, which was our predecessor, available on the ASERA website. And I urge you warmly to mine that resource. Thank you. <laughs>